Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. You've been, you very, very graciously all came to silence together there. It made my life an awful lot easier. Um, just to let you know, for anyone in the room who doesn't know me, and I think I know almost everyone here, uh, but I'm Andrew Elliott. I'm director of the Northern Ireland Bureau, uh, which is based here in Washington, D.C., representing the Northern Ireland Executive, which, uh, of course, doesn't quite exist at the moment, but hopefully will again fairly soon um, in, in the US and Canada. And we, we do diplomatic work, particularly in public diplomacy and so on, and promoting and ensuring that the region is better understood uh, in North America. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to welcome uh, this evening colleagues from the Queen's University of Belfast, with whom the Bureau works very, very closely and has done over many, many years. Um, and Queen's University of Belfast, of course, has a really strong association with the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, that really, really crucially important peace process. Um, and so it's really wonderful to have the chance to have them here and to talk about their various experiences of the peace process and, and related issues in this context. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to particularly welcome at this point, but of course the big event is tomorrow and so on, but just to mention that we have in the room Professor Peter McLaughlin, Dominic Bryan, Dr. Cheryl Lawler, and Richard, Professor Richard Collins, who will be, uh, I think later on this evening, you'll, there'll be a panel situation and Richard will be moderating that and you will get to hear more from them. My plan is not to speak for too long at this point, just simply to say, look, one of the most wonderful things in the world is to have uh, an agreement like the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, not because it's perfect, but because it's there. And sometimes whenever the institutions are down, it's, it's, it's possible for people to become pessimistic and, and to worry about the future and so on. But I, I'm always reminded, and for, forgive me for those who've heard me say this before, I've all, all, always um, reminded of Seamus Heaney's poem, Scaffolding where he talked about the relationship between himself and his wife and how sometimes whenever, you know, things aren't so good, it's really important to remember that there's still a scaffolding there and that's a scaffolding to which people can return. And when I talk to people in parts of the world where there is still conflict ongoing and so on, they say to me, what a wonderful thing it would be to have the kind of scaffolding that you guys have in, in Northern Ireland. So I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we have that. I'm very proud of the fact that broadly speaking, our politicians know what it is to which they will return, even if there have to be some tweaks and changes and so on to adjust to circumstances along the way. So I hope that um, you really enjoy the, um, the film this evening. Very quickly want to um, say thank you to the sponsors. Um, and there are a range of them up there. So. Queen's itself, of course, for their commitment in coming out here. The Northern Ireland Bureau, of course, because, uh, hey, that, that's, our, that's us. But also New York University and the Bedemus Centre, Brooksman Ireland House, with which we work very closely in New York, and Solus Nua, who are uh, wonderful um, supporters and, and collaborators with the Northern Ireland Bureau here in Washington, D.C. It's really good to see you all here this evening. I hope you enjoy the film and that you enjoy the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much and the Bureau for, for supporting this, this event and putting it on and to NYU for this terrific venue and location uh, for, for the screening. Uh, with delighted you could all make it to, to be here with us. Um, I'm Professor Richard Collins. I'm the Dean of Internationalization and Engagement for Arts, Humanities and Social Science in Queens, University of Belfast. And I'm joined today by three um, absolutely terrific colleagues. There are no better people here to really talk about the themes raised by the screening. So we just want to have a little bit of a discussion around those issues. So first of all, we have Professor Dominic Bryan, Professor in Anthropology from the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at Queen's within the faculty. Feedback on this mic. Um, and Professor Bryan's uh, research spans over 25 years of uh, looking at issues around intergroup conflict, on the symbolic, symbolic landscape, flags and flags, parades, um, Belfast in particular, and the shared space and the communities uh, in, in Belfast, and political violence and commemoration. And one distinguishing feature of, of um, 
Dom, I'm going to call you, I'm not going to keep calling you Professor Brian, I'll call you Dominic for now, for, for Dominic's research um, has been the high level of public engagement. He's been directly involved in those community negotiations and within the peace process. Um, and so delighted that he can join us today for this discussion. Uh, also joined by Dr. Cheryl Lawther, who's a reader in the School of Law, which is also my school at Queen's. Um, and Cheryl is also a fellow of the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute of Global Peace and Security and Justice at Queen's. She's also the director of the Human Rights Center in, in, in the university as well. Um, and Cheryl's research expertise lies in the areas of transitional justice with a particular focus on truth recovery and dealing with the past and victims, uh, ex-combatants, reparations, and the use of um, atrocity sites. And a lot of this research has attracted considerable external funding. Last but not least, uh, Dr. Peter McLaughlin, also from the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy, and Politics, is a senior lecturer in the area of contemporary political history in Ireland and Northern Ireland, with a particular focus on the Northern Irish problem and the peace process, uh, including a, a leading work on one of the figures you've seen, the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winner, John Hume. Um, Peter's work also explores in particular, and particular relevance to today, the international and diaspora contributions to peacemaking, with particular interest in the US and EU. Peter was also a Fulbright scholar in 2018 at Boston College, where he looked at the role of the US government and Irish America in the Northern Ireland conflict and peace process. So I hope you can agree a really um, stellar panel for which so we can engage with, with some questions. Um, so my role today really is just to kind of provoke you with some, hopefully with some interesting questions. I wanna ask you all, first of all, just to reflect back, um, reflecting back after 25 years of the agreement, how well has it stood the test of time in your view? In 2023, Dom, you could start us off. Well, um, let me start. I think it stood the test of time well. I think there's a number of reasons for that. There are some significant political failings in it, and I think we should probably talk about those failings. However, it did take place within what are much wider changes in society. So what one of the sort of weaknesses of a documentary like that, that focuses on the politicians and what they do, and, and it's important that politicians do something like that, is it, it doesn't capture um, the changes in society that take place. So let me give you an example. The first, you'll know that discrimination was a deep problem within Northern Ireland. The first equality legislation, I think, was 1977. So by the time we get to that period, you have a generation of Catholics who are now going through Northern Irish society who are not experiencing discrimination in the same way. And that was reflected by the 1990s in significant changes in places like the civil service and the legal system where Catholics were now moving in. Catholics bluntly were moving into the middle classes. I won't, I won't go into in detail, but you saw differences in the way unionism was working. And I think I think the that moment was necessary, but it was a reflection of a change in society. And the reason that it sustained itself well is because those changes have continued. And the Northern Ireland that we live in now is so different from 1969 when the um, when the conflict started because a lot of the fuel to the fire of that conflict has been taken away. And so, so, so I think it's served us well and it was necessary, but I think that's because we live in a very different society um, in that time. Thanks, Tom. Terrell? Yes, I do think the agreement has served us well. I think there's a couple of really telling points in the documentary, and particularly Mark Durkin, who you heard towards the end, was saying that the agreement is like a piece of machinery. You need to love it, you need to tend to it, you need to work it, and when it breaks down, you need to try to fix it or deal with its weaknesses. And I don't think anybody in this room would, you know, suggest that there weren't weaknesses in the Belfast Agreement. And we, of course, continue to live with those weaknesses and those challenges, no less illustrated by the fact that we, again, don't have a functioning assembly or executive. But as George Mitchell said, Northern Ireland is a profoundly different place. Just thinking of entirely about the human perspective, lives are saved, 
young people uh, can live a life just as they would live a life anywhere else in the UK or in Europe. People don't live in fear anymore. Uh, some of the challenges that haunted Northern Ireland for so long, for example, the inequality of treatment in the criminal justice system, the, the fact that we had a police force rather than a police service, we didn't have a culture of human rights. We now have something of a culture of human rights. All of those are profound changes, and that is down to the agreement. There is, of course, still work to be done, but I think it has absolutely served, uh, stood the test of time. I would broadly agree with that. I think I think I, I'm essentially e echoing a lot of what's already been said. I think the very fact that we're here talking about it shows its success. Now, that's acknowledging the fact that right now, as Cheryl has mentioned there, the centrepiece of the agreement is not working right now. It seems kind of ironic for us all pretty much to be endorsing the agreement when we're saying we don't have a government in Belfast right now. But I would stress that that is primarily a result of Brexit. I'm oversimplifying slightly there, but we do have to say that this, that this is a key reason why we've had such instability in Northern Ireland for the last few years is because we've had this enormous change, a revolutionary change, or maybe a, a better, better set of counter-revolutionary moment in British history and trajectory that this is it was bound to massively destabilize the peace process and it has and everybody knew it would um i would also stress that the the 10 years running up to the brexit votes it was working very well the assembly worked very well that even figures like ian paisley that we saw rejecting the agreement there were working the agreement that we had a deal between Sinn Féin and the dup to actually operate the good friday agreement and they worked government for 10 years together pretty much before Brexit. So as I say, I'm slightly oversimplifying there, but Brexit has massively destabilized things and we are still trying to work that out. But the very fact that we're, we still have the Good Friday Agreement, that whatever its imperfections, and I acknowledge and I agree with the points that are made that there are imperfections, nobody has come up with a better idea. No political system is perfect. And I don't disagree with what my colleagues have said about the, 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 the you know, the, the opportunity for changing and evolving it and reforming it. Again, it, no political system is perfect and it's up to every generation to move further towards perfection, to improve things, to make them better, more inclusive, function, adapt to changing circumstances like Brexit, which is a fundamental challenge to the way we do politics in Britain and Ireland and between those islands and Europe. So yes, things could be a changed and amended and we need our politicians to do that. And we need uh, those who support like academics and the media and young people and voters to ensure that they do these jobs properly. But I think the fact that we're here talking about the Good Friday Agreement, it seems ironic that we're celebrating an agreement right now that the power sharing isn't working. But I, I think it can work. I think with the, with the right will and the kind of will that we saw there in, in the video, we can get the institutions working again. And it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be reformed and adapted. But I think, uh, again, the best recommendation is, is, is the fact that we're here talking about it and, and people still really believe in it. So I, th I think that's the best recommendation Thanks, I could give. Thanks, Peter. Um, just I mentioned to Dom at the start your, your research and the public engagement aspect of it. I'm just thinking about the role of academia and leading into the design of the agreement. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that and maybe the contribution of somebody like Brendan O'Leary, who's now a political scientist based here in Pennsylvania. Um, in terms of that power sharing arrangement in particular, where did where did that come from? Well, it, it, it is important because it had quite a lot of impact actually on American foreign policy as well. Um, the, the agreement comes directly from a sociological theory called consociationalism, which is a way of dealing with ethnic conflict around the world, broadly suggesting that to create change, you've got to create leadership groups within the ethnic parties, the leadership groups were the ones that you saw there doing the negotiations, that in theory, once you give them an ability to share power, they will take people along with them. Um, now, that, that, that consociational agreement was particularly pushed by Brendan um, O'Leary, and I know that that went along to influence actually um, discussions and things that took place both in former Yugoslavia and Iraq and a number of places. Now, it's quite interesting because there are criticisms of it. And the criticism, and some would say the weakness of the agreement, is that in giving these groups power, you institutionalize the ethnic division within the system. 
so that some of the criticisms of the agreement have been that those groups who see themselves as others are frozen out of the system because whatever people vote, you're just going to end up with a nationalist and a unionist. And what we've seen in Northern Ireland is a group which we might call the others grow quite significantly. Um, and so, so there is a debate. Whilst I, I mean, I was a big supporter and I was involved in the Yes campaign um, with Quinton Oliver during that period, uh, because we all needed to see that change. The, there are issues to be looked at, and it may be that however well it's worked, uh, our society has moved to a point where the political system might need to be altered. And it, it's, a, it's always scary to go there because you can see how difficult it was to win that. Um, you can see the passion in it. And all of us remain, I think, apprehensive about it. But it is possible, partly because of the economic, the, sorry, the social theory that was used, that we might have to rethink how the political structures work. Thank you. Um, is there a further question then for Peter, which I, I think is probably one of the hardest questions here. Sorry, Peter. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in terms of that contribution, do you think, in terms of the success of, of, or of the achievement of the agreement, did it matter more what was on the table in the sense of the issues, the three strands? We'll come back to talk about the three strands maybe in a bit, but the, did it matter more what was on the table in this agreement or who was at the table? Because they, they talked. Mm -hmm. They talked in the in the agreement in the documentary about you know the direct involvement of those actually engaged in the conflict. But I'm also thinking in your own your own research mm -hmm. of the the buy-in from both north and south, mm -hmm. but also from America in particular. I think so, and I, I think I think that's absolutely crucial. I'm not just saying that because it's uh, there's there's primarily an American audience. Um, I'll maybe come back to the I'll come back to the first part of your question about what whether it's the content of the green agreement or the, or the players that were involved. There's a sense in which you could say that we always knew it was going to be a deal like that. There was those of you not familiar with the kind of history of this. There was a deal very similar to it in the 1970s that, the, in essence, was power sharing like we have today or should have today, and a role for the Irish government that collapsed within six months. So the Sunningdale Agreement of 1973, 74. Um, and that basically was the model for, for the Good Friday Agreement. And you could cynically say that it took 20, 25 years and, and tragically a, a lot of deaths and, 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 and victims of violence for some sides to, to realise that that was the solution. So there are certain actors there who, who were always arguing for that. Certainly the SDLP, people like John Hume, were always arguing for a solution like that. The Alliance Party, similarly, you could argue that it took Republicans to accept that there was going to have to be a deal like that, that it took unionists, including David Trimble, and, uh, but I would acknowledge his bravery in changing his position and leading unionism as he did, but opposed the Sunningdale Agreement, but later accepted a deal along those lines. I would argue it even took the British government to change position, because after a short period in the early 70s where the British government did engage with the Republicans, it then moved to a position where it was very resolutely trying to crush Republicanism and defeat the IRA, which I would argue, some wouldn't agree with this, that it, it, that, that was impossible to do without creating a new generation of young nationalists who would join the IRA, that this was an impossible task, that it took compromise on all sides to accept what was kind of always on the table. I'm, again, I'm oversimplifying somewhat in that, and it, you could qualify that, but the essence of a deal was, of, of, a, of a genuine fair compromise was always there. But then to be more positive about the, the leadership that was involved, you've seen it yourself there, the kind of key leaders. And, and coming back to balance what I said about Trimble, you know, to, to, to change position and to do what he did. And it was incredibly brave. I think history will be incredibly kind to him in terms of his, his leadership in that moment. I would even say Republicans. I mean, there was, there was some clever comments made there about how really they were the ones who were compromising the most. And yet they presented it in a way as which they hadn't really changed position at all. That's that's enormously successful political leadership to be able to do that. Um, Tony Blair and uh, Bertie O'Hearn, as we noted, Bertie O'Hearn, they're kind of dealing with his mother's death and so on. And, and the fact that those two leaders were in power for 10 years, that, that says a lot about them. And the fact that they devoted so much of their, their premierships to the Northern Ireland problem shows how important they were. But I, would, I, I said I would talk about the US particularly, and I'll finish with this, but, but I, I would really stress that even you know, not, not just because it's a US audience. And Bill Clinton, obviously, his administration, the efforts that were made, 
but George Mitchell, I mean, he, he mentioned and there was, there was kind of like a joking reference there to him about wanting to go home to see his child grow up. If I remember rightly, his, his wife lost a child when he was away negotiating in Northern Ireland. He lost his brother as well. His, his brother died of long-term illness. So these things were going on in America, and yet you saw what he had to put up with and, and listening to the same old stories from either side, that he had to deal with a situation where you, the unionists wouldn't actually speak to Sinn Féin. The negotiations were conducted through him. So the unions did not direct the, any of their questions or their proposals directly to Republicans. So they had to work through Mitchell. So it's the, it's the patience and the commitment of this man. And I think that's what kind of, again, I don't think, it, personally, I think it could be stressed more in, in, the, in the film there, that when he called a deadline, people took him seriously because he'd, took, he'd, he'd given so much in, in being away from America and missing the, and not being there for his family through these tragic times, that when he called the deadline, Deadlines have been broken so many times in the peace process before. People didn't do that to George Mitchell because they saw how committed he was. And then you saw how clever he was as well as that. He knew how to be very patient for a long time, but then when he knew he had the deal, as he said at the end there, when you have the votes, you take the, you take the call. And he got everyone in the room for five o'clock before anyone could back out because that was a possibility. So I, I, I really think there's a very good reason we have a Mitchell Institute at Queen's University. It's quite rightly that we, it's named after him is because I don't think we would have a good Friday agreement without the Clinton administration and, and particularly the skills, the patience and the commitment of someone like George Mitchell. So I, I balance it out. There was always a deal there, but it took exceptional leadership from, from a lot of people you've seen there, Monica McWilliams and other, other actors that I didn't speak about so much. Terrific, thank you. And Cheryl, just a question for you in terms of the shape of the, the, the set, the, well, it's not a settlement. In fact, Jerry Adams begins by saying that this, was agreement on the journey without agreement on the destination and that's a theme they come back to at the end of the, the from all sides not just jerry adams saying that and i think it was uh jeffrey donald's at the end said something very similar um is that is that unique to the to the belfast good friday agreement is that have you seen something as open uh, perhaps as a, a non-settlement in other contexts or is it is it a truly unique they, they really stress the uniqueness i think tony blair does as well but is it is it truly a unique agreement? I, I think it's unique because of its unique features and the unique context in which the agreement was signed and the uniqueness of the nature of the Northern Ireland conflict. So any peace agreement has to be tailored to the context in which it is seeking to achieve peace and long-term stability. So I think that is unique. There's, but if you look anywhere in the world, uh, peace agreements constantly evolve and they change and they adapt. They're not static documents, nor should they be static documents or a static set of principles or an ethos around peace. Because as society evolves and peace embeds, or perhaps there are challenges to the peace process, then political leaders, civil society, uh, the population at large need to be able to be in a space where they can respond to those changes to preserve the integrity of the peace agreement. So I don't think it's unique to Northern mm -hmm. Ireland, albeit the Belfast Agreement is a bespoke Northern Ireland solution to our particular set of challenges. Thank you. I mean, fixing on that, the content of the agreement, I want to come, I said I'd come back to the three strands. And I, I wonder how critical those were. This is going to be a follow-up question to you, Peter, so maybe I won't just take a minute at you, but to, to, to everybody. Yeah. Could you today imagine a version of the agreement succeeding which didn't have those three strands? So north, south, east, west, plus power sharing combined. Uh, I personally wouldn't. I, I, I think I think that is that is the correct framework. I, I think uh, you know John Hume always said this idea that the Northern Ireland problem it's not a Northern Ireland problem. It's it's a problem that was pushed into a corner that became Northern Ireland. It's a problem between the nations of Britain and Ireland, the peoples of Britain and Ireland, that you have to have that broader framework, that unionists had to resolve their relationship with the wider context of the island, that, that, that Irish nationalists had to resolve their relationship with the British state. You have to have that wider context, that it is, it's a much more, you know, the Northern Ireland conflict is, is, is a rerunning of, of a conflict that's gone on before there was any Northern Ireland, you know, that there were Catholic and Protestant, or by different terms, that same kind of conflict going in that part of Ireland for a long time. So. I think you, you definitely needed that wider 
context you needed and we saw there with the with the agreement itself that, that you you ultimately needed the, the sovereign governments the governments the british and irish governments to come in and, and be involved in this yes you needed the local parties to compromise you needed to have the irish government do what unionists you needed to do but you needed tony blair to make those decisions about prisoner releases and mo Molum to do likewise you, you you know they had the power to do these things so again it, it, it's you, we reduce the problem to just being a Northern Ireland problem. It is a historical res, re, residue of, of a much broader conflict between the peoples of Britain and Ireland. You need that context to resolve it, I would argue. Thank you. Um, thinking about the community element of this and community ownership, at one point, Senator Mitchell says, if there's ever to be agreement, it has to be yours. Um, Dominic, how, how successful do you think they were in getting that sense of ownership in the Northern Irish community. Um, it was remarkable at the time. Um, within the Yes campaign, it got mentioned there, we were very pessimistic just a few days beforehand. Um, and I know because we, we went on a last minute um, postering so those of you who know north of Belfast you have a number of very sort of Protestant towns of Antrim, Ballymena, Ballymoney and Coleraine and on the night before um, the referendum vote four of us went in a it's a very strange four of us Andy Pollock was with me as a as a, um he was a, a journalist for the Irish Times and one of the other guys out there turned out unbeknown to be, to be my wife's ex-boyfriend <laughs> in this van and we um, and we plastered uh, late at night yes posters because unionist party was it didn't have people who were prepared to go out and put posters up so it, it was left to people like ourselves in the campaign who were comfortable in the unionist areas to do it and um, I remember at the end we we parked the car having got rid of all of the posters and this big BMW pulled up and this guy pulled out and it turned out to be Ian Paisley Jr. And he was furious and he wanted to search the van because he was he was annoyed the posters, no posters had been pulled down. Now, we hadn't pulled them down, so he got in the van. But when I remember when, when, um, when he jumped up and ran away, Andy Pollock, who had written a biography, in fact, of... Ian Paisley's father, the first biography of Ian Paisley's father, turned to us and said, do you know, I think we're going to win because this man is really, really worried. And it was the first sense that we got it. Now, that ownership um, has varied on the time since. So, so the result was, I think, vitally important. And, and my recommendation for anybody holding a referendum, and I think this is quite important if we have a referendum on a united island, make sure it's a big win. 50-50s, however much people might yearn for something to just cross a line. I understand that people feel like that. But the lesson from this, I think, um, is that you need to be sure that that shift is a big one. So that community buy-in, which we lost really fairly soon afterwards, is, is vitally important in politics. You can't there's lots of examples from around the world, Canada and places like that. If you end up getting a sort of 50-50 on it, and, and I think, frankly, the, Bre the Brexit referendum was, was a, a lesson in how not to do it. It was a... So buy-in is really important. And as someone there on the ground at the time, it comes, it comes up on... I think Hillary Clinton says that the, the women of Northern Ireland wrote themselves into the history books at one point there. How important, in terms of that campaign, were the, the, the Women's Coalition, co coalition um, and Monica Williams, who I think personally is phenomenal, um, so I'm probably giving away some of the answer here. <laughs> well, they, yeah, they, they, they made a difference to politics, ironically, not in the way that they originally wanted to, which was really to push women's involvement in politics. And I mean, I, my, I got involved in all of that because I was a member of the Women's Coalition at the time. It was a, a political space that I uh, felt comfortable to be in 
Um, so, so and the reason I got involved in all of the Yes campaign is because the Women's Coalition had, had promised workers to go and work for it, and I was one of those workers that was that that was promised. Um, but they did they did have different ways of working and bringing agreement together. The whole way the party worked which was probably not possible for a big party, was for them to get round in circles and to discuss it any time they want to pull it. So they did, they did and, and, and they were able to profile the fact that on the ground, whilst divisions were always great, there was always networks of people and in the volunteer sector it was often women working together and the fact that you had a party there that pulled that really did have loyalists and republican women working together uh pearl and broner are, 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 good, are good examples uh, uh, of that um i think made a real difference the other thing that was interesting was the Secretary of State at the time, Mo Molan, who was a remarkable figure. And I, 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 hold, I cherish the amount of times that I met her and discussed her. She was, a, she, was a, she was quite a unique character. And just to finish that story, I mean, uh, people might not know, but she was seriously ill through most of the process and probably knew that she wasn't going to live for a huge amount of time onwards and there's lots of theories there was a good drama on it which wonders whether she was brave in her politics precisely because it was an end for her um, but the relationship between monica um and and mo molam and that was 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 also crucial in it i mean i don't i think one's got to be careful not to exaggerate it sometimes i feel that they overplay that part of it, but it still was very, very important at the time. Thank you. And uh, staying with the, the Women's Coalition and thinking about your own area of research, Cheryl, uh, uh, it's almost remarkable in the, in the in the agreement that it comes to light that if it wasn't for the Women's Coalition, there was nothing in there originally in terms of in terms of the rights of victims, human rights institutions. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about their contribution in terms of the, the content of the agreement in those areas and legacy and historical injustices. Yeah, so I think I'd really like to respond to that in two parts. I think a little bit like Dom was saying, we need to be careful perhaps not to also overplay the role of the Women's Coalition. It is absolutely true that people like Monica McWilliams worked so hard to make sure that the agreement made reference to victims. But where the agreement makes reference to victims and survivors, it says that a true memorial to victims and survivors will be the achievement of a stable and just society. And that's all it says. But yet the agreement has tracked on the reform of the police release the reintegration of political prisoners, as you saw in the video, on the creation of the Human Rights Commission, reform of the criminal justice system. It is absolutely silent on the need to deal with the legacy of the past in terms of truth and justice, but also to, need to deal with the other needs of victims and survivors. And we live out that legacy on a daily basis in Northern Ireland. Many of you who follow the news will be aware that just two weeks ago, the Conservative government passed a new law, the Legacy and Reconciliation Bill, which is effectively a closing down of all of the avenues for truth and justice in Northern Ireland. And that comes 25 years after the Belfast Agreement. That is a profound rollback on victims' rights, and it's a profound re-traumatization, a second wound for many victims and survivors who lost a loved one perhaps 40 years ago and have spent the last 20, 25 years campaigning for truth and justice. And that writ has now been completely closed down. So there's that on the one side, but then there's other issues related to victims and survivors and the legacy of the conflict, which we still do not deal with, and are now, continue, now starting to affect younger generations. So for example, in Northern Ireland, we have incredibly high levels of PTSD, one of the highest levels of PTSD in Western Europe. We have one of the highest prescription rates for antidepressants. Former combatants have significant problems with alcohol addiction and drug addiction as a way to deal with the experiences that they have and continue to haunt them in the present day. We have a very high rate of suicide amongst young males, and all of that is directly related to the conflict. Also, the ever-pressing and ever-apparent issue of transgenerational trauma 
is coming to the fore more and more. And it's not just children who are displaying symptoms of trauma, it is grandchildren of people, victims and survivors of the conflict. And often that doesn't present in a necessarily immediately obvious way. Maybe it presents as children having problems at school or sleep problems at home. And when they are assessed by child psychologists or educational psychologists, without a doubt, every single time they tell me that it is conflict related trauma that those children have absorbed, often by silence. And that is a direct result of our failure, both to deal with the past in respect to formal processes of truth and justice and reparations, for example, but also that we haven't ever properly engaged with that wider legacy of trauma and the impact that that has had on society. So yes, the agreement makes reference to victims, mm -hmm. but that's where it stopped. And I think that is one of the fundamental flaws of the agreement. Thank you. Um, this, this actually relates and, and comes from this issue of, of, of trust. Um, we'll close with this question on, on trust and maybe if we have time, we can take a few questions from the audience um, as well, if you've got any. Sure, some of you might have. Um, Fame, this at uh, you, Dominic, but perhaps for all of the panelists as well. The theme of trust comes up a lot, and it comes up at the cross community level the issue of distrust, or mistrust, or de decommissioning, prison release. Um, and it seems to me the other issue of trust that comes out of this is trust in the future, and this is the, the future generations, the intergenerational trust. And I wonder whether it's fair to say that the only way that they got past the distrust was to trust in the future, is that the future generations would actually make this work when the fear was that the other side perhaps wouldn't. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, when I've looked at peace processes, I do think that, that um, the human relationships that, that allow the development of trust are absolutely vital. Um, and I think when you look at failing peace relationships, that, um, um, that also becomes very obvious. Um, uh, and I think, I think um, the, I, I'm a great believer in what gets called community relationships, that you've got to find ways of binding people together with common sense of interests where they can share a way forward. And one of, the, one of the ways that's happened in Northern Ireland is actually the space that people work in has become more diverse and complicated. So things like the Pride event in Belfast brings young people together. For some, it would be quite controversial because you get protesters at the Pride event as well. But it, 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 with different identities, the environmental movement in Northern Ireland is bringing people together with different identities. And that binding and the relationships of trust as they work on things, I think, binds society together. And, and, and we do... We do... I, overall, when we look at Northern Ireland now, we look at... A, a, a place that remains significantly divided. We haven't mentioned the education system yet, which drives some of us to distraction. Um, but there are an awful lot of spaces that exist that people from right across the different communities work together. And that's why I have a lot of faith in the future of Northern Ireland. We, we are not the society that existed in 1969 or indeed the one in 1998. And for that reason, I have a great deal of hope. Thank you. Do you guys want to add anything? Yeah, maybe if I could just build on, on what Dominic was saying about trust at the community level and people being able to operate, whether that's through work or sport or leisure, in shared spaces and much more diverse and plural spaces. And I think that is where the trust and, and the hope for the future comes from. But I also think reflecting back on the documentary that we watched tonight, the politicians who signed the agreement, not only did they demonstrate tremendous trust in the future, but also courage and leadership. And I do worry that at the level of political leadership, which of course has an impact on communities and societies, that today in 2023, and as Peter was saying earlier, largely because of Brexit, we don't have those relationships of trust 
and it's not necessarily the same level of courageous political leadership mm -hmm. that we saw in 1998. And I, I think of the key people in that documentary that took absolute leaps of faith and have delivered Northern Ireland to a place where we can come here and reflect back on 25 years of peace and a largely successful peace agreement. So I am hopeful at the level of society, but I am concerned at the level of politics where there is an absence of leadership and I think an absence of courage as well. Again, it's, it's always difficult when you're answering the, to, to other people. I'm going to echo a lot of what's been said and I'd agree with a lot of what's been said and maybe just going back to that core thing of, of trust and bringing it back to the politicians as Cheryl was there. To say that it, again, to, to stress that point, that it, 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 it did work for a period before Brexit. I, I, I know I'm re-emphasizing that point now, but um, that you had even politicians like Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, you know, former self-confessed IRA commander, sitting down together and working in politics and having actually creating a, a, a real genuine, such to the point where it was mocked, you know, they were referred to as the Chuckle Brothers, because these two guys who, who were seen as so important in being actors in the conflict and yet you have these kind of almost you couldn't make this some of this stuff up about you know when Ian Paisley retired and 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 Martin McGuinness uh, painting him a picture and all this kind of stuff you know just in things that would just seem unthinkable mm. so relationships generally did form through that period even between Sinn Féin and the DUP but it shows when you have people even from very different backgrounds coming together that they can working their pro common problems of how do we deal with the you know the health service and the economy and education we get and we focus on those things you you, you develop uh, trust between yourselves and brexit again has massively destabilized that is is for me part of the genius of the good friday agreement it was it was it kind of the constitutional question how can you resolve it and, and, and instead it kind of the phrase we use is, is to kick it into the long grass to say well look it can't be dealt with let's let's focus on what we can what we do have in common we have common problems of deprivation and unemployment and and and, and domestic abuse and all these other things which are common across the communities let's concentrate on making those things better and that was happening before brexit what brexit has done is it's it's, it's kind of as i say use that metaphor of kicking it into the long grass it's got the constitutional question and brought it back center stage because we are now talking again about the border about uh, whether there should be a poll on a united ireland about whether britain is become whether northern ireland is becoming more irish or less british or whatever we're back to the fundamental debate that, that paralyzed northern ireland for decades instead of doing what the good friday agreement did do for a period of saying let's come and let's let's concentrate on the fact that we have the worst waiting lists in in the, for the, in western europe in, in in terms of hospital waiting lists that's our real problem let's deal with the problem of the environment which is the most fundamental thing facing humanity and northern ireland's got to play a part in that we've had even Loch Ney, you know we've had in the re recent weeks you know the the, the, the biggest lake in, the, in britain and ireland is dying because of the it's being neglected and the way we're treating it so we've got these common problems that have to be addressed together and it's only through politicians coming together that they, they, they see that they're actually human beings and whatever, even the horrible things that we're doing, you could have someone like Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley come together. And, and I'm amazed at people who mocked that, what they did. I thought it was very brave what they did. And whether there was a bit of an act, good, good. Should let show that leadership of saying, we can sit down, we can, we can be mocked as the Chuckle Brothers, if that's gonna make people see that actually Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness can sit down and help run Northern Ireland and do a good job of it. So uh, I, I would try and end on that positive note, that's the last question for, from you on. So yeah. saying trust is, is absolutely vital and and we did have it and we can get it back, but it, but it needs, as Cheryl was saying, you, you need brave leadership, you do need that. Thank you. I don't know, I was gonna try and steer it to a positive note and bridge the transatlantic divide by bringing it down to Derry Girls. And you see, and you see that leap of faith. It wasn't just leap of faith from the politicians. That, you know, the real, there was a part in the documentary where it, it says that you know in the south they didn't really get why there wouldn't be support for the agreement in the north, but it, would, it, it fundamentally under underplayed the level of you know leap of faith that was required of people to trust in this set this or non settlement this this suspension of the of the issues. I think that does that comes out in that brilliant show very well. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time if there are questions and you you will have to well we're probably at the end but we're going to take okay, five minutes um you have to shout a little bit i'm afraid without microphones but. thank you very much really interesting discussion um in your current situation in northern ireland potential demand for what 
Well, one of these answers is that, and America knows this very well, disinformation during the Brexit debate was just terrible. I mean, I, it's a very personal feeling, think the referendum should have been null and void right from the beginning because of the way the question was set up and the way that the, the arguments took place um, in, in what was potentially one of the most complex things that any country has ever done to its space in the world moving out of, of, a, of a highly networked relationship with Europe. Um, and, and, and I think people know the arguments that were made during that period now look almost comical, but there was disinformation right the way through. So, so I think, I think it's done, personally think it's done enormously damage. I don't think I know enough about how those networks are changing politics generally, but they seem to be making a massive difference. Um, but I think you know that in US politics um, as well. Yeah, maybe actually just to add on to that, I totally agree with Dominic about the sort of fantasy land, basically, of the Brexit debate, and that so many of those statements about 350 million are going into the NHS on a weekly basis are now basically laughable. I mean, it's well, I'm not going any further than that. But I think also in respect to the legacy of the past, there will be a future that will be continued to be built and presumably fractured on disinformation. So for example, the role of the British state in perpetuating the conflict in Northern Ireland, we know some of that, but we don't know the full details of that. So the unanswered questions of our past continue to abound. And I think the Legacy and Reconciliation Bill is a piece of legislation to protect the myth of the British army and the myth of like imperialism and empire. And that is not the reality of, of what happened in Northern Ireland. And victims and survivors and NGOs that I'm involved in will continue to push back against that misinformation. And that does not give us a stable basis for moving forward on. I maybe like, like Dominic there, I would say, I'm not the best person to answer this. I don't do any social media whatsoever. I like, I, I just, <laughs> And I think I, I don't, and I, and I think there's, there's 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 disadvantages to that, but I think there's great advantages as well. Um, but I, 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 it's a really important question. I think you're, you know, and obviously as Dominic was saying, that you've you've seen the consequences in the US and with a really important uh, 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 debate like Brexit, and I think you'll see it again next year in the US. And it, it, it's absolutely vital in how these big media platforms operate and so on. I think the, the key thing I would take from it is, is, is it, it means our jobs and all of us really, I imagine people in this room who do similar jobs, our jobs become even more important because we're, we're trying to, you know, argue the case of, look, there are, there are facts, but there's data, there's real empirical evidence. There are real things that we can prove it. Yes, there's interpretation of historical facts and there's a proper way to do that and to appreciate people who have different opinions. But to say there are certain things which did or did not happen and it makes our role as educators or those of you who work in the media or, or, or in, in politics in, in, in supporting politics, the civil service and these kind of things, uh, it makes our jobs more challenging, but absolutely more, much more vital as well, you know, because we see it even again with the most fundamental thing like the environment is that we all know the facts and the scientists have been telling us for a long time. And they're, they're far more important in the research they're doing with something so important. But it, it also needs people in the social sciences like ourselves to win this battle of narratives because that, that's what I understand in social media is a lot of it is to do with creating these narratives. You know, it's not about facts. It's about what, what is the most persuasive way of presenting an interpretation. And I think that's what people who do the jobs like, like a lot of us, I guess, in this room do. It, it, it's, it's such an important thing as part of democracy to make sure that we are saying, look, there, there are there are key facts and there's data here and there's there's things that are misinterpreted and made up. So it's it's a really, really important question that you raise. And, and as I say, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer it, but I, you know, um, I, I can't bring myself to engage with social media as a way of combating it. And and, and that's not going to happen. But I, I, I do take my job very seriously in terms of... You, you realise you're people. missing all of my tweets oh, on, what, <laughs> on why we should have new cycle lanes in North Belfast. They're not, they're not tweets anymore. You're <laughs> behind the... Oh, they're not tweets. Uh, no, what are they called? X's or whatever? Post, uh, yeah. But no, it's, it's an important, vital question, absolutely, yeah. 
Thank you. Any further question? I think I'm getting, oh God, can I take? My boss is in the back. Susan, how many, how many questions can we take? A couple? Two, okay. <laughs> okay, we've got a hand. Okay, we've got a hand here and a hand there. So the, the gentleman first here. Hi, Dominic, I think it was you who said uh, the power sharing uh, construct in Stormont may need to be yeah. looked at. Um, but, and, and Peter, you, you had mentioned the outsized impact of Brexit and bringing the tribalism out again. Mm -hmm. So, is there any appetite at all for seriously looking at that construct? I think there is, but there's also a logic that might inevitably mean that happening. I, I won't go into a long explanation now, but but the way that the power sharing takes place within the assembly and the voting takes place within the assembly, which gives nationalism and unionists various ways that they can that, that they can be made to share. If you have a block like the Alliance Party who don't register as nationalist or unionist, and they've gone from five, six, and seven percent up to 17 or 18 percent, eventually the logic of them not being part of it must mean the system changes because you're leading too many voters out of con control. So, so I think the if if the present trend is continued the pure logic of that. And by the way, the people who, who argued for consociationalism wanted that to happen. One of the logics behind consociationalism is you build a center ground. And I actually didn't, I've got to be honest, expect that to happen the way it's happened. But that center ground appears to have, have, have appeared. And so I think the logic is that there will have to be a change at some point. Thank you. Final question. Yeah, um, briefly, thank you all for being here tonight. A uh, question for you, Cheryl, to your point about legacy. Why, in your view, were there not stronger transitional justice mechanisms in the agreement itself? Why weren't there any sort of comprehensive measures to, to deal with the past? I think there's two parts to that answer, uh, and both are not necessarily particularly easy listening or easy hearing. Uh, basically, in the first instance, there wasn't something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission or other branded process of dealing with the past written into the Belfast Agreement, because it simply wouldn't have been signed if people were asked to look back into the past and deal with those difficult issues. If you think of how difficult it was to get reform of the RUC and the difficulty that that posed to narratives of loyalty and, and sacrifice and the symbolic change that went with reform of the RUC, and then you add in prisoner release on top of that, reform of the criminal justice system, there is no way any of the signatories to the Belfast Agreement would have wanted to open the skeletons in the closet. So the agreement simply wouldn't have been signed. There is another element to the agreement which is interesting and it feeds into the why we don't have a broader process of dealing with the past. And if you look at all the distinct elements of the Belfast Agreement, and you sort of put them as a table. So you might have prisoner releases, reform of the police, re uh, demilitarization, et cetera, et cetera. There are all separate mechanisms for review and reform and making of recommendations as to how to do all of that. But they all operated in isolation. So for example, the conversation about reform of the police didn't overlap particularly with reform of the criminal justice system. The release of political prisoners didn't particularly inform the conversation on the reform of the criminal justice system. And they, that is because if you had started to link up all of those different issues, then what you would have been exposing would have been catastrophic and perhaps would have, in fact, again, maybe led to the agreement not being signed in the first place, but to a complete breakdown of trust and political and social stability in Northern Ireland. So both in terms of the individual mechanism for dealing with the past, but also we had a very disaggregated process of change to protect, I think, some of our difficult questions. Thank you. On that note, I'm going to have to end. I'm going to ask you to give a round of applause to the panelists for your contribution. Um, On behalf, on behalf of Queen's University of Belfast, thanks again to all of you for coming down. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely.